And now we'll begin the second part of chapter 10. One day the king had been more cruel than ever to his cat. He had beaten him and kicked him and even gone so far as to twist his tail to make him scream. The cat, who was no longer able to bear such a treatment, decided to run away that night. So again, he hid under the king's bed and there he waited for his chance to get to the garden. As was his custom, the king got up in the middle of the night and opened the stone in the wall. The cat waited until he could hear the king's footsteps no more. Then he crept down the stairs and out into the garden. And before the king knew what was happening, the cat climbed up the tree and ran out on one of the branches. There, he stopped long enough to bite off a small sprig. The next minute, he leaped, landed on top of the wall, and bounded out of sight. So he ran away from the king and the king was sorry he had not treated the cat better. The cat ran and ran and ran. He never stopped until one day he found himself back in the kingdom of the animals. What he did with the sprig, no one knows for certain, but it is believed that he planted it and that it grew into a tree just like the one in the king's garden. People think this because in a few years, the kingdom of the animals became very rich, much richer than it had ever been. And the only way to explain this would be that the cat planted the sprig that he stole from the little garden and that the sprig grew into just such a tree as was the source of all of the king's wealth. Word of how rich all of the animals were came to the ears of the cruel king. When he heard it, he sent his army and army after army to try to conquer the kingdom of the animals. But always these armies were beaten by the wild animals until the king lost so many men that he had to give up the fight. Since then, few men have started for the kingdom of animals to look for the tree. <clears throat> Only two or three have ever found the kingdom. All of those who got there, none of them no one has ever seen the tree, but probably it is still there, waiting for the right person to pick a sprig off of it. All of the animals guard it closely and do not like to have people trying to find it. So perhaps it's just as well that more men have not set out to go to the kingdom of animals. Thus the old man spoke. And when he had finished his story, Sar asked, is it really true that there's such a place? How much money do you suppose, suppose there is in the tree? The old man said, that I don't know, but I do know that there is such a place. Nar asked, if I pick a sprig, could I plant it and become rich? Yes, said the old man. Then the two older brothers asked how to get there. And the old man told them, they asked how much money they could make and what the tree was like. And all they could think of was the fortune that would be theirs if they found the tree. But Jinnuk remained silent. He said nothing. His mind was full of thoughts about the animals. He wanted to see them, 
to talk to them and live for a while in their kingdom. Whether he found the tree or not made little difference, but with all of his heart, he longed to see the animals. To him, that would be much more fun than finding a lot of money. That night, the old man slept in the house and early the next morning, he went away. No sooner had he gone than Sar and Nar talked of setting out to find the tree. Jinnik wanted to go with them as far as the kingdom of animals, but they laughed at him and said, how could you go? You are small. We could not be bothered taking you along with us. If we go, you must stay here with mother. And they bragged and they boasted about how strong they were and how they could do what no one else had ever done before. Finally, their mother got so tired of hearing them talk that she told them to go. She made them each a new suit and gave each a strong pair of shoes. Then she prepared food for them to have on the way and she sent them off with her blessing. And they left home in high spirits, promising to come back with all of the riches in the world. Chinook stayed with his mother. A year passed and no word came from Sar and Nar. It was the spring of the second year when one day Chinook was out in the fields blowing soap bubbles. He had a beautiful big pipe that belonged to Sar and the bubbles he blew were almost as big as Chinook himself. As they drifted away in the breeze, he ran after them as best he could, laughing and singing all the time for he had never been so happy. Finally, he decided to see how big a bubble he could blow. He dipped his pipe in the soap suds and blew and blew with all of his might. He blew so hard that before he knew it, he blew himself right through the stem of the pipe and into the soap bubble. When he looked out, he saw the fields and trees sinking away below him. Thousands of rainbows seemed to be dancing all around. Higher and higher he went until his own house was just a speck on the ground. Then he saw a lot of mountains slowly drift by and fade in the distance. Soon, he was out over the blue sea and in every direction he looked, he saw nothing but water. All the time, the big soap bubble was rocking back and forth like a cradle. This made Janook sleepy. He could stay awake no longer. So he curled up in the bottom of the bubble, closed his eyes, and went to sleep. All the time that Noom Zor Noom had been reading the story, the sound of the distant waterfalls had been getting louder and louder. By the time he reached the part where Janook went to sleep in the bubble, the roar of the waterfalls was so loud that the old man could not make his voice heard above it. So he stopped reading and said, there's no use of my reading anymore. There is too much noise. The captain said, that is a good story. I wish you could finish it. I can't, said Noom or Noom, not now. Hardly had he spoken these words and put away the crystal block when the ship rounded a bend in the river. And there, right ahead of them, were the falls. They were higher than any waterfalls in the world. And the cliff that the jade water fell over was made of rock as black as ink. For a while, Tall looked at it in amazement. 
Then he said, I like those falls, but where are the whimsies? The captain shouted, look in the water, you'll see them. Tall did as the captain told him. He looked into the water near the falls and there he saw thousands of little people. Their bodies were bluish green and their heads looked exactly like little bubbles. They were swimming and turning somersaults in the water. And every now and then, some of them would climb out on the rocks and dive back in. I've never seen any people like them before, said Tall. Do they do anything but swim and dive in the river? That's all they do in the daytime, said the captain. They love nothing better than that. At night, they go to their houses and work coating, coating the pebbles with jade. Where are their houses? asked Tall. In the cliffs behind the falls, said the captain. You'll see them in a minute. The boat sailed around one end of the falls and went in behind them. Then everything became green, for all the light was colored by the water that it shone through. Behind the falls was a wide, deep pool that ran along the foot of the cliff. It was in this cliff that the Whimsies lived. Each of them had a little hole in the rock and each hole had a little golden door that opened and shut with a latch. In front of the rows of holes were ledges wide enough to stand on and in the rock were cut steps leading from each ledge to the one above. The whole face of the cliff back of the falls was covered with rows of holes and ledges. In all, there must have been 10,000 whimsy houses. Alongside this cliff, the ship stopped. The captain and his men got out and they went from hole to hole. They reached into each hole and took out a handful of jade colored coated pebbles. And in their place, they put a handful of ordinary pebbles. All day long, they worked without stopping and Tall and Nooms or Noom helped. By night, all the pebbles from the boat had been exchanged for jade beads. The captain said, we must be going. I don't dare, dare to stay here after dark. Do you wish to go back with us? No, thanks, said Noom Zornoom. We'll stay here. But how about the rest of the story? I'd like to hear it, said the captain, but I haven't got time. It's late now. And unless we get out from here before dark, we shan't be able to find our way down the river. Don't let us keep you, said Noom Zornoom. Just leave us anywhere here. So the captain sailed over to where there was a flat rock and there he left Tall, Nooms or Noom, and Millie Tinkle with their golden basket. After he was certain that he could do nothing more for them, he sailed out from behind the falls and went away. As soon as the boat had left, Nooms or Noom took Tall to another part of the cliff where the captain had not been. There at the foot of the cliff, he showed him three big holes that looked like caves. Out of each one, a river of green water was pouring into the pool behind the falls. Nooms or Noom looked at them and said, we must go up one of those underground rivers. One of them leads to Troom, but I don't know which. The other two, Go to places from which no man has ever returned. How will we find out which is the right one? Asked Tall. I'd hate to go up the wrong one. And how are we going to get up? Nooms or Noom said, The Whimsies know. If we are nice to them, they will tell us. 
They will even pull us up in our golden basket. If they won't tell us, we must stay here. You mean we'll never get to Troom? said Tall. I wouldn't like that. We'll get there all right, said Nooms or Noom. It's just a matter of time. Then they went back to the flat rock and sat down to wait until evening came. For as soon as the sun began to set, the whimsies always left the water and came back to their homes in the rock cliff behind the falls. That's all for this time.